the evidence that we have in terms of the Ukraine and the Red Sea is that notwithstanding the fact that the US spends the most of anybody in the world on the defence industry, it actually does not have the capacity to dictate terms in the way that the marketing brochure would want you to believe. But I think we also have to see that Japan and South Korea and Australia are already being integrated into the US yes. strategy, which uh, looks very much like the kind of European response to the Ukrainian disaster. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have the pleasure of talking to two colleagues. One is Susan Weiglin Schwierzig, a China specialist with a special focus on con contemporary history and politics. She was a professor of Sinology at the University of Vienna until she went into retirement in October 2020. Susan is also, she's a German citizen, but she's currently in Austria. And then we have Warwick Powell, who's an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology and a senior fellow, a fellow of the Taihe Institute, who's also specialized on questions of China multipolarity, and he's the person I am with in the Multipolar Peace Alliance. And today we want to discuss China's role in this emerging multipolarity and exactly what kind of multipolarity. Susan Warwick, welcome. Hello. Okay. So thank you very much for agreeing to this talk today, also that we can do it between the three of us, because I think both of you, you have your uh, specialities and you have your view on how China works in the international system. Maybe let me start with Susan, because you sent me a short piece in which you are kind of explaining how you see that China is moving. And you are also uh, pointing out that the Europeans are probably not properly understanding um, how China sees the emerging multipolarity. Could you maybe flesh out the way you see China moving? And then I'll ask Warwick to react to that. Yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And um, I think maybe we should start out to understand that originally, which is before the war in Ukraine, China did not use the word multipolarity very often. They used it for a certain period of time, and then it somehow faded out. It was not at the center of uh, discussions in China because I think at the time they actually wanted to divide the world into two. They wanted to find a way to coexist with the U.S. in order to avoid war and at the same time be recognized at um, eye level with and by the United States. But with the beginning of the war in Ukraine, I think a third actor came into the game, which is Russia. And one of the reasons why Russia decided to use the tool of a military attack was that it wanted to make clear that this world could not be divided into two. And I think this is really an interesting change Uh, and we are grappling with this change because we don't, I don't think we really understand it in all its implication as of now. And China had to move away from its original plan to divide the world into two, into somehow integrating uh, the idea that um, uh, Russia wanted to be the third player. And now Russia comes in with the idea of multipolarity. And it does not really tell us what multipolarity could be like. And I think maybe there are also differences in understanding between Russia and China uh, as to what we need to understand under multipolarity. Um, I think for the Chinese side, they understand that the regions of the world that um, are sort of make up the global south need to be integrated into this multipolarity. And they also understand that somehow this multipolarity will be a game of not only many countries or more countries, but it will also be a game between the most powerful countries, which according to their assessment today is US, China and Russia, and other countries from the region. And I think that is why we are seeing now countries all over the world sort of 
sticking out their head and saying, you know what, I want to be part of this multipolarity and I want to sit at the table of multipolarity. And for China, I think the uh, institution and the location of multipolarity will be the UN Security Council. They keep repeating that also time and again, and we have the BRICS and we have the role of India and we have the the now 50, 50 African uh, heads of states basically visiting Beijing. Warwick, do you do you did you also notice this that there was a change in twenty twenty two in the in the ch China's rhetoric about multipolarity? Um, I probably paid a little bit less attention to individual words. I guess that's never really been. Uh, the way that I've approached um, China watching, if you will. I mean, there is um, a particular approach to China which does focus a lot on the, you know, specific utterances and words, I guess, in speeches, and that has been part of um, one way of tackling China or trying to seek to understand China for a long time. Um I take a little bit further step back, which means that perhaps some of these things aren't as clear because I'm further away. And the step back that I take uh, looks to the ways in which China has sought to navigate a world from 1949 onwards. And we'll recall that uh, 70 years ago, it um, was an initiator of the... Um, the principles of peaceful coexistence. It was an active participant in the Bandung processes. And for the entire period of the post-war era, the People's Republic of China has been seeking ways in which it can build a sense of national sovereignty in a context that obviously protects itself and advances the way it views its own interests without necessarily becoming dragged in excessively into other people's battles. Now, in doing that, it's obviously been party to the creation of multiple new institutions that sit adjacent to or alongside those of the post-war settlement, the UN Security Council, United Nations, and things like that. And I'm talking specifically about institutions such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS, etc., which have been uh, part of a practice of uh, non-aligned multipolarity, even without the words. And I say that because I think what we have seen, and perhaps this does dovetail a little bit into um, the other comments from Susan, is an emergence of a more expensive Explicit attempt to think through what Chinese foreign policy as a discourse and as a practice actually looks like as a great power. So we have recently, in the last few years, seen three key documents released, which is the um, Security Initiative, Development Initiative, and the Civilization Initiative. And all of these combined speak to shape a way of exploring and thinking about China in the world. I think this is a work in progress, which I guess is uh, what we're trying to grapple with, is that it's not a locked in, solid state, um, fixed in time framework or approach, but it's a work in progress as China seeks to understand itself, understand its immediate region, but also be responsive to clearly an environment that is in substantial transformation. So what we are trying to do here is from the vantage point of like living in Australia and living in, in Europe, trying to understand uh, China, that's like the, the basic discipline of Sinology, right? I mean, looking at China from the outside. Susan, um, you also wrote in your emails that you don't think that China is properly understood or how China seeks to redefine its role in the world. Um, how do you think that um, that China is grappling with this process now? And how are the Europeans grappling with China, grappling with it? Well, I think first, the, the Europeans have still not understood that they need to take China as a world power. 
They think that China is somehow, um, you know, they are a little bit afraid of China. Most of the time you're afraid of something if you don't understand it. And I think this is the basic problem that we have, that people think that we don't understand China and we cannot understand China. So simply you don't need to bother because you simply cannot understand. And when somebody comes and says, you know, I don't think it's so difficult, you know, you simply have to be on top of things, then they're very astonished. And they don't really like to take this for granted because it's much easier for them to, to simply rely on what is they are being told in Washington about China and then simply take this for granted. Uh, the biggest problem, I think, is that we do not understand how China wants to be recognized as a world power and how China at the same time wants to avoid war as a means of telling everybody in this world that China perceives of itself as a world power. So if you compare China and Russia again, you will see that at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, China was really shocked at what was going on in the middle of Europe. I mean, Mr. Blinken said, you know, that, of course, Xi Jinping was informed of all of this and things like this. I, I don't believe in this at all. But, you know, it was a good narrative at the time. And this narrative is still going on, you know, of China being uh, uh, sort of uh, the best friend uh, of Russia. Um, I think if you if you read what was written in the newspapers in China at the time when the war started, you saw how China was shocked. And why was China shocked? First of all, it was shocked because Russia was using military means to articulate its and define its position in the international system. And secondly, they also thought it was a bad idea to attack first. The Chinese always love to be the second in a conflict, not the one who actually ignites the conflict, the one who reacts to somebody else attacking. Uh, this is um, Sun Tzu, a very traditional way of looking at military conflicts. And, and at the time when the war started, you know, when you read social media, but also the official uh, Renmin Rebao and other newspapers in China, they would always insinuate that it was a mistake for the Russians to go first. They should have waited for the other side to go first. So uh, I think this is something that we don't really understand. You know, we for a very long time in Europe, we thought that China was just our best friend because we were making lots of money in China and we didn't want this to be changed. Now we go into the other direction and our leadership tells us that China is really, really a big threat. And although we also think that Russia is something that we need to be afraid of now because the policy in Washington is changing towards pivot back to Asia. So um, we Europeans are also pivoting to Asia and we're looking at China suddenly as a major threat to Europe. I don't believe at all that China is a threat to Europe. And I think that um, for China, the most important thing is actually to win Europe and to drive a wedge between the United States and Europe in order to isolate the U.S. and make it impossible for the U.S. to um, somehow militarily um, do what they think they need to do in order to um, get their interests to a point where they want to have it. There are all of these stupid narratives around, and sometimes it's difficult to know which narratives are being taken serious and which are which aren't. And I remember, like uh, several years ago, that there was a a military. I don't know whether he was a general or like he was a relatively high person in the Swiss military who seriously on Swiss radio said, "You know, we need to prepare for the moment when the Chinese are attacking Europe." And I thought that was ridiculous. But there's people who believe stupid stuff. But and this narrative that China is a extended threat to Europe is there. And Warwick, um, the how do you how do you react first to what Susan just said? And secondly, how do you see the the um, narrative projection of um, U.S. NATO about what China is at the moment? Yeah, there's a fair bit to unpack there. And um, a lot of what Susan said, of course, um, really opens up a lot of avenues for further reflection. I think probably, uh, well, let's see how we go. 
I think the first thing that I observe in, in this current dynamic is that there is um, China's China, and then there's America's China and Europe's China, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that the uh, dominant Western discourses about China, the ones that have become particularly dominant in the last um, six, seven, eight years or thereabouts, have increasingly drawn on a series of caricatures, number one, and mobilised the general rhetorical and affective armoury of fear. So we, and, and that's underpinned by this notion of threat. And we see this um, right across the transatlantic narrative structure about China that permeates uh, the attitudes that the uh, the, the Western allies, even in Asia, whether it's Australia, Japan, et cetera, uh, view China as well. The China is now viewed through this frame of threat. Now, this frame of threat actually has a very, very long historical pedigree. Um, Regardless of how irrational in many ways it is, it draws on the fears and paranoias that have from time to time animated Western attitudes towards China. And these attitudes go back um, many centuries. So I think that's the first thing to to take note of. The second thing that I I tend to um, uh, often try to reflect on is not only this idea of China's China, but how China perhaps is seeking to think about the world and how that contrasts conceptually or discursively with how the uh, mainstream Western uh, foreign policy elite tend to think about the world. And in these different perspectives about uh, what the world is and how countries exist in the world, we start to find uh, reasons for understanding uh, difference, if you will. So... The Western framework, in many regards, views the world as comprising of a series of atomized countries or nation states that interact with each other with a series of defined interests. And the interactions are largely anarchic because there is no overriding Hobbesian um, uh, you know, overrider um, keeping, keeping things in charge. The United States, of course, seeks to play some kind of a le- Leviathan role um, through its position as hegemon, but in large part, uh, the view is ontologically that the world is made up of this atomized set of nation states. China, on the other hand, views the world holistically, that all parts of the world are interacted and intimately intertwined with each other as the starting point. And that sense of holistic mutual coexistence versus the atomized Um, uh, disparate existence set of relationships, I think, frames the world in incredibly different ways. And that's a useful starting point for understanding China's China, China's view of the world versus the West China and the West view of the world. Susan, do you agree? Well, I would totally agree that this is um, very important that we not only analyze the um, U.S. American and European narratives on China, but also China's um, view on China. But I would say that we need to understand that China not only looks at the world holistically, but it also recognizes its own interests in this world. So this implies that China is trying to actually reach its aims as part of this holistic view of the world which makes our perception of what is going on in China really complicated because uh, you just mentioned the three documents that the China uh, that China released um, during the last years and uh, i think this idea of you know the global uh, community of a shared, a shared future uh, which china tries to uh, propagate and to sort of develop as an alternative narrative to the Western narrative on how the world should be like. Uh, I think it is very interesting to see that there is a certain uh, conflict between what China is saying and what China is doing in the region. Because China is saying that it doesn't want to use military means. It is saying that it wants diversity and recognizes diversity and diversity 
the holistic view of China of the world is that the universe is made up of many, many different diverse elements, and every country has the right to follow its own logic, tradition, and, and culture. However, if you look at how China treats the non-Han Chinese ethnicities in its own country, and how China actually tries to impose its dominance over East Asia, you see that the Chinese approach is not only, you know, we love everybody and everybody can do what he or she wants, but it is also a country that thinks about the um, uh, situation of international relations in hierarchical categories. And the hierarchical ca categories, I think, come from Chinese uh, history and from the historical experience of the tributary system in which you actually see China as the center of a region. And by being the center of the region, China has always viewed itself in the past as the center of the world. And I think this is a um, sort of uh, an element of Chinese thought that we need to have in mind in order to understand why China is much more assertive in its own region. It is coercive in its own country, in its relationship between Han, the Han Chinese majority and the eth ethnic minorities. And this element needs to be integrated into the story, although the Chinese, of course, don't integrate it themselves. The I find that quite interesting because this was a que is a question to me. It's like, especially when it comes to China's, let's call it near abroad, which is a, a Western IR term. Oh. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the 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 relationship with the Philippines, in my view, mm -hmm. could be way better uh, if there was more of carrots coming from China and less of a stick. But there was a lot of stick coming uh, when it, when it comes to the Philippines. But at the same time, China is very good at outreach to countries further away in in Africa mm -hmm. in in also in South in South America and it uh, it it offers at the moment uh, a more a more well multipolar or diverse uh, uh, view mm -hmm. of the world and then the problem with the West is that they always map their own concepts on the other the way that they behaved in their hemisphere and they how they perched especially in the United States, in North America, the entire native population, that's what they then expect China will do in its sphere, which is not the same approach, uh, what they are yeah. doing with non-Han Chinese uh, uh, people. Uh, Warwick, do you want to react to that? Like the, the China's view of its near abroad versus the, yeah. the larger world? Yeah, I think that there's probably two things. One is, is that I actually don't buy the characterization of um, Han Chinese approaches to the 55 minority groups that now comprise China as being coercive. That's a pretty typical Western trope that um, has been particularly proselytized in relation to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang without a shred of evidence. The um, dealing with um, ethnic minorities within any nation state, a modern nation state, of course, involves all sorts of interesting challenges about how does a nation state uh, preserve and create this sense of nationhood, which is that idea of um, uh, a, a, an extent of homogeneity, whilst at the same time enabling heterogeneity to exist. Now, every country has these challenges, and I actually don't accept the characterization that the way that the Chinese have tended to approach minority groups historically um, in the last, um, you know, 60, 70 years has been uh, particularly coercive. But we can put that aside for half a moment. The, uh, the, the issue of the Philippines, I think, is also interesting too, because uh, the question of carrots, of course, was heavily in place um, until about two years ago um, when the Philippines was um, a different government. And China had a, a, a more uh, economically oriented uh, engagement with the Philippines, providing significant funding and infrastructure to develop infrastructure in the Philippines. But those relationships, of course, in the last two years have um, uh, you know, become increasingly rocky with the change of administration. So that's one part. So it's not just that China has a coercive approach to its near neighbours. In fact, it, it hasn't in relation to the Philippines until very recently where tensions have flared up. 
The second interesting point is the contrast China's approach to what Vietnam's doing in the South China Sea mm-hmm. versus what the Philippines have been doing in the South China Sea in recent times. And in fact, the Vietnamese have been engaged in a far more aggressive and expansive um, reclamation program over quite a long time in the South China Sea without ever stirring up the hornet's nest of Chinese uh, reactions to it. And the interesting question for mine is actually not China per se, but what is it that marks the difference between the Vietnamese approach versus the recent Marcos government approach? And the big difference is that the Marcos government has over the last 18 months or so sought to strengthen by reactivating its historic military relationship with the United States through the expansion of bases in the Philippines, um, through the short-circuiting of the constitutional prohibitions for American troops or foreign troops on Filipino land, and, of course, uh, enabling the Americans to deploy short- and medium-range missiles on the Philippines targeting China none of which, of course, leads to an environment that is conducive to the biggest player in the neighbourhood, China, viewing this in a benign fashion. So tensions and issues always involve more than one. The last point that I'll make goes to this question of tribute. There is, uh, following Fairbanks, a very uh, standard narrative around how tribute states work. Much of that scholarship has been unwound and debunked through more detailed examinations of how the so-called tribute system actually worked. And it was far more subtle and far more complex, so much so, in fact, that um, the idea of China being centre um, did not see any of the Southeast Asian nations become sinified, number one. Um, and interestingly, often when tributes were provided to Beijing, the emperor, in times past, the reciprocal gift was of substantially greater value to the tribute offerer than was the value of the tribute itself. And that was the nature of what was ironically an an asymmetric relationship that came with being the biggest and most influential player in the neighbourhood. I totally agree. I think we need to uh, to sort of look very closely at the uh, mechanisms of the tributary system. And some of my research is actually aimed at this because we shouldn't say, you know, because China is the center, then it uh, sort of uh, coerces everybody else in the region into uh, taking over specific functions and tasks. And I would also agree to the situation, how you describe it in the Philippines. I I think what China wants is that the other countries in the region accept that China is the major player. So we can say that China plays a dominant role, or we can say that China is the center of the region. Whatever we use, what China wants is that these countries actually acknowledge that China is the major player. Why does China want this to be acknowledged? It is because China knows that it's sort of... um, um major competitor, which is the US in the region, actually is using countries in the region in order to make China feel that it is not acknowledged as the center of the region. So with other words, what we're uh, seeing in, in Philippines is exactly what China is afraid of. So that the US is actually sort of um, helping sort of alternative political elites to take over and establish themselves with the help of the US as a force that can make China's position in the world, uh, in the region, very uncomfortable. So I'm not saying that China is coercing the countries in the region. I'm saying that China is actually very much like uh, hundreds of years back in the tributary system. It wants to be acknowledged as the major player. This does not imply that it is telling everybody what they need to do. And I think that China is quite happy with the um, attitude of most countries from ASEAN that actually have a relationship with the US, but also have a strong relationship with China. China is quite happy with this situation. And it's the same logic with the uh, ethnic minorities in China. Uh, By the way, I'm not just buying this uh, narratives. I I actually was able to do... um, a field research in Xinjiang before things turned into what people now regard as a coercive regime, 
at that time, I when I was there, which was from two, 2007 to 2010, when I did my field work in Xinjiang, we were already seeing that China was step by step changing its policies. And it has not always been coercive. China has been changing from very, very inclusive ways of handling the relationship between the Han majority and the minorities to sometimes very coercive means. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And why does it do this? It is because according to a very, very traditional logic in China, this sort of um, polity, which we call China, has its center, which is in Beijing at this time. And they see that these minorities are actually their borders to the rest of the world. And if the rest of the world uses the borders in order to endanger the stability of the center, then the elites in China have always been very, very nervous. And at this moment, the central government in China actually sees us, the West, using the unhappiness of some of those minorities, big minorities, by by the way, in in the center regions of Ch uh, in the uh, peripheral regions of China, as being, you know, sort of instruments of the West in order to destabilize the situation in in China as a whole, and that is why they try to sort of um, make this impossible by being more coercive than in the past. I think this is something that we can definitely say, and you see it in all the documents that the Communist Party of China is actually um, um, writing on these issues. You also see it in the academic debate that they think it is necessary to sort of um, not um, sort of put a stress on diversity but to put a stress on homogeneity. And this is one of the reasons why things have changed in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Mongolia, in the peripheral regions of China. Yeah. Look, I think in, um, in just about all large geographical um, territories, the peripheries are, uh, are always an interesting zone, aren't they? And um, particularly where you have ethnic differences between those who live at the peripheries and the others who tend to dominate a particular um, nation state or, or polity. And, um, and, and I think that uh, what happens, of course, in China is that Susan said, as, as the peripheries uh, are attacked from external forces, then the, the regime um, will necessarily respond to that, to stabilise the peripheries and to minimise the risks that those peripheries become sources of chronic instability overall. I think the other thing that's very interesting um, in, in all of this is that uh, the, the, the idea of, of um, being recognised as the, as the main player within Asia is uh, also related to a post-war and possibly also a pre-war historical experience about um, how the United States has framed China. Mm. And the United States has framed China from the late 1800s all the way through as, in many ways, a frontier to be conquered, both in an economic sense where possible, as a market to access, et cetera, et cetera. But importantly, also, I think, as a frontier for spiritual warfare. So we saw from the late 1800s through to the revolution, a significant growth, particularly in Protestant missionaries from the United States, work their way through China, play very important roles in the public debates at the time about what a modern China could or should become, to a point where Chiang Kai-shek and his wife um, were baptised as Christians and where many in the KMT, in the Republic of China at the time, actually viewed their purpose in creating the new China as creating a Christian China. Now, we come to 1950, and the missionaries had basically been pushed out. Many fled to Taiwan or Hong Kong. Some left the region forever. Others stayed with a view to rebuilding a foundation to go back in. And we see this in the historical documentation 
um, both from the US as well as from the Taiwan lobby, the ROC KMT lobby that was active in Washington throughout the 1950s and 1960s, seeking to maintain and mobilize ongoing congressional support to reclaim China. And this campaign was taking place against the backdrop where the United States was having, in the early 1950s, a fervent domestic debate around the question of, quote, who lost China, right? And this idea of losing China wasn't just a military defeat, it was a defeat at a spiritual warfare level. And and we know this because the communists were the godless ones, and we see this in the archival documentation from McCarthy and others, who also described Chiang Kai-shek as the guy who was fighting our war. Chiang was fighting our war. And the our war, in the context of McCarthy's very famous speech, was followed up by commentary around the godlessness of communism. Now, set against that historical backdrop, it is little wonder that those sitting in Beijing would harbour a deep historical sense of what it was that they viewed the Americans were always ultimately up to in terms of their presence in Taiwan Island, as well as the work that they were doing in Hong Kong and in the region, generally speaking, which was to continue the prosecution of the spiritual war to reclaim what was lost in 1949. Susan. Yeah, you can say that the uh, communist takeover in China was the first defeat that uh, the U.S. had to uh, acknowledge after the uh, Second World War. The second defeat, of course, was uh, the Korean War, and the next defeat was Vietnam, and so on and so forth. So, so the the, the question of the U.S. not being able to actually to impose its system on the world at large. Uh, mm. is very much a problem of East Asia. And for that reason, Taiwan is such an important um, location in this world where mm, the US and China have their very, very um, uh, clear interests in trying to show the world that they can actually solve the situation for their own good. So that is why I think that Europe should not sit idly and just uh, watch what the US and China and Taiwan are actually doing with regard to the Taiwan issue, but that we as Europeans have the duty to actually get active in trying to make it impossible for both sides, for China and for the US, to use military means to solve the Taiwan question. So this is, of course, a totally different approach from what we see in Brussels at this moment, where people actually only sort of side with the U.S. and, and think that this is the best way to support Taiwan. But the more we support the U.S. and the more uh, the U.S. actually decides that somehow there is no other way than to go against China in some with some military means, the more we will see this world falling into pieces in a very, very uh, terrible and brutal way. And that's why I think that Europe as a continent that has actually should have learned from the past that we avoid war, should get very active in trying to avoid war over Taiwan. I think this is because of what you just said. Both sides have very good reasons to be really angry at each other, especially when they lose, lose trust in each other. And at this moment, I think we need to say that uh, China lost trust in the U.S. and U.S. does not trust China anymore. And this is a very, very dangerous situation. Yeah, let, look, let just... I think the question of Taiwan, let me just quickly touch on this, um, Pascal. Um, it, people often forget history, right? And the problem is, is that when you have short, um, attention spans or you have a limited um, uh, lens in terms of how it is that we're where we are today. We tend to view things purely from the point of view of the here and now. Now, Taiwan Island um, is the it is part of a civil war. Right? Let's not forget that. 
This civil war has not concluded. Both sides of the Straits don't recognise each other's sovereign claims over the same national territory. There is no armistice and there is no peace treaty. In fact, the Republic of China maintained a policy position until 1991 of seeking to build up forces to a point where they could attack the mainland and reclaim the mainland. And it was only after then that it came to change its position to a defensive posture. Having done that, it also made amendments to the Constitution of the Republic of China, dealing with a special designation for the territory of Taiwan in the context of China as a whole. So Taiwan Island is part of Free China, the Taiwan area, but it isn't a distinct sovereign entity. That's the key point to remember. So we have a civil war, unfinished. Civil wars can finish in a few different ways. One is, is that we kick the can down the road for another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in an evolving status quo that does not end up in bloodshed. That's one distinct possibility. Another possibility is a resolution where the parties agree on a settlement of some kind. Now, that resolution can happen in a few ways as well. One is without bloodshed, and the other one is with bloodshed. So we are at a moment, a pivotal moment, where the question that the West needs to really reflect upon is whether or not it wants to play a role in the peaceful resolution of a civil war or not. And those who have been advocates of positions that have in effect been salami slicing the one China policy, pretending that Taiwan Island is a sovereign entity in and of itself, de facto, um, ignoring the, the, the legacy, the real legacy of an unfinished civil war are playing with fire because they are pursuing their own interests ahead of the interests of the peace of both sides of the strait. May I interject? So I yes, they're not, only, say, they're not only going against their own, in, uh, against the interests of the two sides, they are going against their own interests, because if there is war over Taiwan, the world economy will be uh, falling into pieces with our, within a very short period of time, and the, the 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 war will be internationalized and not a war between Taiwan and China within a few days. And this will be very bad for the world at large. Yeah, the one problem we have is that there are people, uh, especially in the Washington establishment, these neoconservative circles, that actually take that they take that as okay. We are we are willing to pay this. This is fine with us. Uh, uh, they have they they did that with Ukraine. They're doing that with, with pushing a war that could have de been de-escalated at several points. Also by using a neutral Ukraine, for instance. Uh, and th there are circles who are willing to do that. I call them warmongers or whatever you want. But there are people who who who, yep. who seek this. Unfortunately, I, I want to interject though two yep. things. One, my observation is that. The, an interesting fact about uh, uh, conflicts that drag on is that they tend to change. In my view, the the, or, the original question between Taipei and Beijing was, who is China? Is it Taipei, the Republic of China, or is it Beijing, the People's Republic of China? And that question is settled. Nobody, none of the two sides argues this anymore. The question is now, is Taipei is the Republic of China and, and Taiwan, its own distinct entity. No, That's a completely different... I don't different... agree at all. You... But the, 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 not, the narrative of the conflict changed, all. didn't it? No, not settled at all. And this is my point. There is a section of the Taiwan political establishment that wants to proceed on the basis that this question has been settled de facto, has been been settled de facto because they actually want to prosecute the idea of Taiwan independence. Now, to do that, they actually have means to do that. Firstly, lawful means, that is. Firstly, they need to get a resolution passed in the legislative UN in Taipei. There are provisions that enable the redefinition of the territories that constitute the territories of the Republic of China. Then there needs to be a referendum of eligible citizens of the free territories, right? 
they're not going to get either of them up. They're not going to get the first one up. So they're going to proceed on the basis that somehow this is an accepted reality de facto, but that's not actually the reality. The reality is, if you go remember, take Suda Tango, Beijing does not accept that as a de facto claim. But right? does, so, does Beijing the accept of, the existence of the Republic of China? No, neither side accepts each other. That's the point, right? Beijing sees the People's Republic of China as the successor of the Republic of China. Yes. The Repu- mm-hmm. So this is not a question of two Chinas. There is only one China. Which one will it be? That's the issue, right? And until people get their head around this, see, a lot of younger people think, oh, there's an island, right? So it's easy to define this island, you know, because it's uh, geographically distinct. But that's not the issue. The issue is about sovereignty, right? The fact that there is a, a series of territories involved, some of which happen to be fully circumvented by ocean, is a different question. And so until we actually resolve this first question, so Taiwan, Taiwanese separatists have the means by which they could pursue their aims if they were actually game to do so. I doubt that they are, even with the tacit support of folk in Washington who are the warmongers who want to push this, right? Because who is game to call the bluff of the People's Liberation Army? Who is game to call that bluff? What we've seen in the last two years is the ability of the People's Liberation Army to rapidly encircle the island in the name of defending the sovereignty of the country, not as a means of invading it. You don't invade your own country. You defend it from external threats. So I'm explaining a view from Beijing. Right? Now, if that's the case, the island's surrounded, it has 10, 10 days' worth of fuel, and what happens then? There's a blockade, there's a no-fly zone. That's the danger where things can go kinetic, and that's the Correct. thing that it so, would be nice if we can avoid it. Yep, so I go back to my original description of the sort of scenarios. The alternative to this is the status quo that continues to be an evolving, changing status quo. And this is an issue as well, because there are different views about what the status quo means. So you get from Washington the rhetoric of, we oppose the unilateral changing of the status quo from either side, right? Except Washington's view of what the status quo is and what Beijing's view of the status quo is, is actually quite different. Uh, Washington is actually quite happy to provide arms and training to the island of Taiwan, the Republic of China, um, now, as far as the Chinese are concerned, the status quo goes back to 1972 um, and the joint declaration um, and the subsequent declarations from Jimmy Carter, where um, there was actually an agreement to withdraw American troops from the island of Taiwan. Um, so the status quo has always been salami sliced by the West from the very first day. Does that sound a little bit like what happened in Ukraine? where agreements were signed and ignored. So this is the problem that we've now got. So I think you're right, Pascal, in that time does amazing things because as people who experience certain things die, um, the younger generations have different experiences which shape their expectations and their parameters in terms of accepting what is legitimate and what is not. So the longer you can kick this can down the road, the better the chances that there may be a different outcome. I'll come back to this or something related, but Susan, do you want to react? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think we have to come back to the situation in the South China Sea to see the relationship between what is going on around Taiwan and what is going on in the South China Sea. I think it is very interesting to see that uh, when Xi Jinping and Joe Biden met in San Francisco last year in November, they somehow agreed that during the presidential election times in Taiwan, they would actually calm down the situation in Taiwan. And it's very interesting to see that ever since the situation in the South China Sea has been uh, 
uh, actually ameliorating, which means that escalations go up in the South China Sea and they have been going down in the vicinity of Taiwan uh, for the time being. However, as the US is extremely um, active um, with regard to Israel, Gaza and Iran, the actors, the smaller actors in the region, the Philippines on the one hand side and Taiwan on the other hand side, see that the U.S. actually has to withdraw some of its navy from the Pacific in order to cater to the needs of Israel. And for that reason, they become more active in pursuing their own agenda. And I think it's very interesting to see that the newly elected president in Taiwan, who only received 40 percent of the votes <coughs> of his electorate, most people in the West simply overlook this. You know, the two other candidates have 60 percent. He only has 40 percent. So he was trying to be nice with his first speech after the election, but then already his uh, inauguration speech and recent speeches that he made sort of uh, say very clearly uh, what Warwick just tried to explain to us, that he sort of sees the status quo as being defined by the People's Republic of China acknowledging the de facto existence of an independent state on the Thailand of Taiwan and vice versa, because he said, I'm ready to go into negotiations with the mainland on the basis of uh, absolute equality, which does not in, imply that Taiwan is a province of the central government of Beijing, but that it is equal to the centra, central government of Beijing, which is actually um, a new definition of status quo. It is going much further than uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, his predecessor. And I think we see that China is now trying to react to this situation by this uh, uh, blockades that it can establish within a comparatively short period of time. Historically speaking, we see that if the um, economic situation on Taiwan gets worse and worse, then uh, the elites on Taiwan tend to split and tend to find a pragmatic solution of the situation. And I think this is what uh, China is actually heading for at this moment because they know that a war against Taiwan will not only be catastrophic for the world economy, for the Chinese economy, for the Taiwanese economy, it will also not really be, they're also not really sure whether or not they can win this war. So they're using other means, and I think they hope for this split uh, within the uh, Taiwanese elites as one way of solving the problem with a comparatively low degree of military um, activity in the region. Yeah, I think, Susan, you've made some really good observations there in terms of the, the voter position um, of the recent election. Um, interestingly, electoral systems vary from country to country, and electoral systems, like all games, and I mean this in a game theoretic sense, generate particular kinds of outcomes by virtue of how the rules are created. And one of the interesting outcomes in a first-past-the-post environment, which is exactly what we've got in the, in the uh, presidential elections um, on the island, is precisely one in which a plurality is sufficient to enable the candidate to prevail. So you've actually got a candidate who uh, is the executive head um, but doesn't control the legislative um, mechanisms in the, in the legislative yuan. Now, that tells us some very important things, that in fact, the population at large is actually not overwhelmingly committed to the, the, the agenda of the DPP. That's one. Mm -hmm. And that's quite important. It goes to Susan's second point, which is uh, the ways in which the elite and the demographic basis that those elite represent may actually fall in the context of the blowtorch being applied because that's what we're talking about, is a change in the military come economic arrangements that will affect the livelihoods of those on the island. Now, the elites will respond quickly. There's no two ways about that, in my view. And that, in fact, I think the pressure will be on 
for phone calls to be made from Taipei to Beijing incredibly quickly in the event of a serious blockade to protect the island from external forces. And I mean protect the island from external forces in terms of American forces on Okinawa, American forces emanating from the Philippines and American forces emanating from the Western Pacific. So in all of those contexts, what we've got is a situation where um, I actually think that the uh, that the military planners in Beijing are reasonably confident, firstly, that the Americans can't prevail anyway. So the Americans can't prevail anymore. They are not in a position to be preponderant in the Western Pacific, um, and therefore the Americans... Um, are going to have to have second thoughts actually about what they're willing to do. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because I think that there's some changes in the nature of war and military technologies that actually enable China to already today bypass the first island chain, number one. And number two, I think the evidence that we have in terms of the Ukraine and the Red Sea is that notwithstanding the fact that the US spends the most of anybody in the world on the defence industry, it actually does not have the capacity to dictate terms in the way that the marketing brochure would want you to believe. Uh, But I think we also have to see that Japan and South Korea and Australia are already being integrated into the US strategy, which uh, looks very much like the kind of European response to the Ukrainian disaster. And uh, I think this is, of course, something we have to have in mind, especially if there is yet another war theater going to evolve from uh, the uh, situation in the Near East. So uh, the US knows that it is already in a situation where it has to be active in so many different regions of the world that its focus on East Asia cannot really um sort of um to be in effect and so that is why they're mobilizing yeah. um the japan they're mobilizing uh, south korea, uh, south korea they're mobilizing australian forces and it's very much um sort of uh, up to these countries to to show or not show whether they are in support of a possible military action over taiwan between china and 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 the US. But um, as we can see, I think the US has learned that it needs to mobilize other countries to fight on its behalf, rather than being directly involved into military, uh, into military theaters. And this is especially true when two nuclear powers like uh, China and uh, the US actually would meet on the battleground. They are trying to avoid this. We see that they actually signaled this very early on uh, when uh, Russia, um, when they talked to to sort of about the situation in Ukraine, they said, we will never interfere because they know the enormous danger of two nuclear powers going against each other. And this is yet another reason why they have to mobilize the countries in the region. And this, of course, is a very, very tricky situation because um, the more you mobilize countries in the region, the more the Chinese government will get nervous and maybe not always take the right decisions, especially, and I think with this, I would like to end this intervention, India is of enormous importance in this uh, context because, as we know, Japan and South Korea are countries with a comparatively small military force. They, they, They cannot simply in terms of manpower, match uh, China. But if you integrate India into this uh, group of countries that are willing to support Taiwan in a situation where China actually goes uh, by military means against uh, Taiwan, this would imply that they have the manpower from India. And that's why they're working on India and trying to, to get India into this alliance because then they're well prepared for everything they think. This this discussion is so huge. We need another hour, but we have to wrap it up at this point. (laughs) One, because I have another meeting. B, because I really need to go to the toilet. But we will do a continuation. And I I give you one uh, one minute, Warwick, and then one minute, Susan, to finish the, the debate. Warwick. Oh, look, it's it's really a discussion. I mean, I'm not quite sure whether there's any any 
points of um, real disagreement. I think we're just adding uh, depth and richness to to the reflections here. The um, the the issue, I guess, I think I'd, I'd wrap up on these points. Firstly, that um, any um, interventions on the part of Western powers and their allies in relation to the question of the Taiwan Straits is an intervention in a civil war. That's the first point I'll make. The second point I'll make is that um, uh, I I think uh, Susan is dead right that the Americans uh, are in a position where they are compelled to seek to mobilise others. Interestingly, of course, in mobilising others, um, these others are largely dependent upon the Americans for the hardware. Now, that's a problem because the American weakness now is actually fundamentally related to its industrial capacity and its supply chain of repair and replacement. And on all of those fronts, they can mobilise um, all of the allies that they want. But unless those allies can be furnished with the hardware necessary to prosecute a sustained engagement, then those allies will basically be lambs to the slaughter. Mm-hmm. Maybe I want to wrap up up by sort of uh, bringing in a thought that we have not yet talked about, but which we maybe should be talking about um, when we meet the next time. It's very interesting to see that many people speak about the end of the Second World War era. But at the same time, the Second World War era and the post-World War II era is still playing an enormous role in what is going on at this moment. And it's very interesting that the two countries that were defeated during World War II, Germany and Japan, are going to play a major role in what is going to develop within the next months to come. And I think maybe we should um, talk about this. I mean, me being a German, (laughs) I'm, of course, uh, very, very sort of uh, interested in understanding the situation. I don't really know whether I already understand it. And maybe with Pascal being in Japan, we also have someone to to enter the discussion to look at this from a Japanese point of view. And I think that would be really important and very, very interesting. And here's my my suggestion for the next panel that we're going to do. We're going to do this, but we are not going to start in 1945. We're going to start in 1931. Okay. Very good. With that, my friends, yeah. Susan Warwick, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks. Thank Pascal. you for having me.